on that? Yeah, yeah, we can start. Uh, all right, so yeah, so this week, I think it's like the last chapter in JLOX, right? Second to last? Oh, uh, we still uh, have an inheritance. Yeah, so we're talking classes. This might be the longest chapter so far. This is a, this chapter was dense. Uh, but anyways, so we just, uh, we start by just going over what, you know, a class is, right? So classes, you know, there's three things you're, you know, I, you have to be able to create and initialize new instances of the class. You got to be able to put, uh, you know, data on the instance, and then you have to be able to write methods for the classes. So our, so the way that our uh, grammar identifies classes is just, you know, you have the class keyword and then an identifier, and then you just have a bunch of functions inside the class. So let's see. And we've, I mean, we've done this before. So, you know, what a function is and how to list the parameters. Um, let's see. Then, what else was here? Um, yeah, so we just, you know, we add it to our parser so we can start parsing classes. Uh, it's pretty simple. So far, the parser, you know, we just uh because I mean it's similar to how we've done other things. Because since our parser is just a name and then it's a list of functions, so it's literally just you know, so you make your list of methods and then you um and then you parse each of the functions and then you add it and then you return that. Um also it's pretty simple is how we bind those things together, right? Because, you know, a class name is the same as, you know, function name or variable or anything else. So you just, you know, you set those in our environment. Um, and then obviously to interpret it, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, but uh, so right now, you know, this is what, so this is how we actually represent our class. Uh, inside the interpreter, but right now it literally just has a name, so can't really do anything with it. Uh, so, of course, in order to be able to start doing something useful, we got to be able to make instances on it. So, uh, so there's more history about like other languages, like how to create instances of things in other languages. Uh, th so this was this was pretty interesting. Like I didn't know that in Smalltalk you even make classes by calling methods on an existing object. So that's uh, that's weird. But I know that like most languages, you know, you'll either have a new keyword, or you just have like a, or you'll have like constructor functions. So normally like some kind of static function inside of the class that will just return an instance of itself. Um, in, yeah, in Java, it's like both. Yeah, in C, C++ plus doesn't need new, but I guess. Yeah, yeah so in different. C++, plus, that's pretty common to have like the static, the, you know, where you just have a static function that does it. Um, it's also, I mean, that's also kind of how you do it in Go too. You know, if you want a function to like, you know, return it, then you'll just write a function that will return an instance um of the struct or whatever we're talking about in that case um although one reason pretty much one of the main reasons he's the new keyword in c plus plus well well because like new can like allocate and if you want your allocation to like throw then uh you might put new in there uh yeah So what else we got? Um, okay, so yeah, we're just implementing call for uh, uh, for classes or making it callable. So this is where we do this here. So now we have our locks instance. Um, so this is gonna be the, so the locks class that just holds like all of the methods and whatnot, but the locks instance, this will actually, 
this is kind of like where we're putting our data, right? Because it'll be the runtime representation of it. Now we talk, we go more actually into the difference between the locks instance and locks class data. And there's, there's a footnote, which I actually thought about when I got to this part in the chapter, but there's a footnote talking about if we really need a locks class and a locks instance, or whether we could just sort of have locks instances all the way down, which is very like how it's done in like prototype languages like in uh, JavaScript or something? And in, in JavaScript. Uh, here, I guess another interesting thing is because we are doing a dynamic type language, logs class is also a runtime representation. Like a class has a runtime representation on like in say Java or say Parapas, that class is just like oh, a stamp yeah. at compile time. I see what you're saying, yeah. So technically it's all in runtime. You're right. So I guess the, yeah. So the real difference isn't actually the runtime or not. The real difference in locks or at least in J locks is that the quote unquote class is like where the methods are. <laughs> and then the, so the class is where the methods are. And then the instance is sort of where your data lives. Um, I think. So speaking of properties, so then we're going to get into how properties work. Um, yeah, our grammar here is getting kind of confused. I had to like stare at this for a few seconds to figure out what this meant. I think he's going to draw a picture at some point. Or no, he's going to draw a picture for other things. But uh, yeah, so we're going to start working on properties. And the way that we do property access, he calls them get expressions. So get expression just means property access. So of course, you know, you just have your object and then you have your, the name uh, and that's all you need. So you can see here, like, you know, so you egg dot scramble three with cheddar, then this is just, you know, how you, you know, this is the, this is our AST here. Um, yeah, so what's interesting is that we don't result or, um so when we resolve we don't resolve the right hand side like we don't resolve the name or sorry yeah yeah, yeah. so he talks about this here so yeah you only recurse into the expression to the left of the dot because we're really doing this inside the interpreter right it's probably an optimization that could be used when we resolve it Actually, I'm not sure about that. But anyways, we mostly just do it in the uh, interpreter. That's how we decided to do it. Um, so let's see. What else is there? OK, so then we make a hash map for all the fields. Uh, basic. Yeah, you know, you know, you look it up and you get it. Uh, there's a neat side note here about the best way to actually store it because as we see here, you know, we're using a hash map, but they talk about that, um, that VMs like JavaScript, which I'm more familiar with. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of optimizations that they use. So like, instead of, uh, so one of these is hidden classes. So I think I've, I've read this, I've read this before because um, I've done, I do like a lot of performance work with JavaScript. So these are things that I've had to learn while like profiling uh, JavaScript, but essentially they, they just, you know, you can sort of like squish the fields together, uh, especially if you have like nested things like, um, you know, like you're inheriting stuff. Uh, so JSVMs will do a lot of optimizations around that. Um, well, but obviously, so in order to do things like this though, we get rid of the, uh, a lot of the dynamic lookup, right? Because we can't do this trick anymore where we don't resolve the right-hand side of it. So essentially what the JSVMs do is that they have to guess about what the shape of things will be, but that's that's not all the time in optimized JavaScript interpreters. Um, so then we have get expressions. So now we have set expressions. Uh, it's so set expressions are pretty much the same, except instead of having two things, it has three things 
you know, because you have to have the, so essentially you have the object that you're accessing and then you have the property on the object that you try to change. And then you, of course you have the value that you're going to assign it to. Um, let's see. What else we got? So yeah, um, so the property itself is dynamically evaluated, but when we visit the set expression, we just, uh, so we just get the value and then the, the object that we're setting the thing on. Uh, the interpreter is pretty straightforward. We just assign it. Uh, you know, we just uh, assign the value to the, Sorry, we assign the new value to the name, uh, which we define here. So methods are a bit trickier. So this is where I think this chapter started to get. Uh, so this is where this chapter started to get really confusing to me, at least, which is you have this problem here, right? Where, you know, what exactly is M? And then you might think, well, in this case, you know, saying M argument should just be the same as object dot method and then argument, which makes sense here, but he gives more examples on how it can get more and more confusing. And especially since now we've like implemented this uh, in our interpreter, you know, it's confusing to think about how to do this, especially, uh, where is it? So, so like there's this example here where, you know, you have two persons, Right. And then you say bill dot say name is Jane dot say name. So what exactly should happen? And this kind of depends on how you define your uh like your closures and your your scoping of like whatever this is, which we haven't gotten to yet. Because like you can imagine this either saying like Jane here, because if Jane dot say name, like in our runtime, if say name, if this method already um like if when we say Jane.say name, if this already uh, includes the environment that Jane is in, so in this case, the name, then when we assign it to Bill, it should say Jane, right? But if instead, if when you call this, it will do a runtime, like if it will look up as you call this, the parent that you're calling it on, then it would say Bill. So different languages do it differently. Um, it and, could be more complex, but more confusing than JavaScript is this, though. <laughs> like, yeah, well, this is kind of the same problem in JavaScript, right? Yeah, it's, it's just like JavaScript used a very confusing solution for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the way that it does bind. Yeah, so the way that it works in JavaScript is like, you know, if you have like, I don't even know, like, so if you have some array, you know, oops. Uh, so if you have some array, then obviously you can do a dot push. And now you have this, right? But then if you say like, uh, let C equals a dot push, or let's just say, let's just call it push. So push is equal to a dot push. So then you think, well, if I call push three, and then I, you know, print out what a is, and it should be one, two, three, but it said it, you know, blows up. You know, because instead you got to do, I don't even remember how to do it. You got to do like push.bind or something. Is that, is that how this works? Or push.bind a comma three or. No, that's not it. How does this work? Like that? Yeah. So like you have to call this thing called bind. Yeah, it that... binds a into this. Yeah. So it's pretty confusing. So as soon as I like started reading the beginning of this section, when he said this and then that, I knew where we were kind of heading, what the problem was. But I was interested to figure out the solution because like I've never implemented a JavaScript VM or anything like that before. So like I don't know what the trade-offs are on doing it different ways. In here, well, it's not an implementation because well, we are not talking about actually very performant 
uh, VM, we are just seeing no, I, I these sure of these different how, semantic differences. Yeah, I meant traders in terms of how easy it is to write, you know, because like when we talk about these things here, you know, like when you're writing, I was curious, like, okay, well, when I'm writing the interpreter, is it going to be easy to, would it be easier to just have every method copy its whole state in there at the time that you like, do this or is it easier to have it looked up in runtime sort of like how it works in javascript so yeah i think the javascript ways is easier to implement but hard to use basically. yeah so we're just trying to figure out how to do that and then so in locks we go with um i guess we go with more the latter approach where so like in, I'm actually not sure exactly what this would do in JavaScript. I mean, we could try that. Like, so um, if we have this, what the heck? So if we have this, that JavaScript, and then we say that, probably gotta put a new layer. So we have that, and then we have this. All right, so now what happens if I say Bill dot same name? It says Bill, okie doke. So, Right. Oh, okay. That yeah, because it's because it binds it to Bill, right? Or when you when you run this, it'll use the this from Bill. Yeah, it says like it, just the last paragraph. It says in JavaScript, it will print Bill. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah, because yeah, because and you know, in JavaScript, method are basically just a function. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, however, in locks, uh, you bind this to the, so it, the, the question is sort of like, when do you bind this to the instance, right? So in JavaScript, it's not bound until you run it, right? Which is why you have to like, you know, with that push example I showed earlier, it didn't work because it didn't remember what it was bound to. Um, but in locks, uh, we do figure it out what it is when we first, uh, like when we first call it. So when we say like, you know, Jane dot say name, we figure all that out. Um, so anyways, so we have that. So we're just going to, you know, write our resolver, which is how we, you know, so here we can see that we are resolving this, uh, uh, when we declare it, so in our visit class statement. Um, actually, I actually don't remember this part. What are we doing here? Um, so we have our methods. Right, so we fill all the stuff up. So we put in the environment when we're creating the class. Okay. Um. Then I actually don't remember this part. Uh remember doing the other parts. What did I do here? Um take all these and wrap them into a map keyed by the method. Yeah, name. it's just like we need to actually have a runtime oh, representation right, right. of all the methods. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So yeah, so we're just filling in the, the locks class and we can pass in the name and the methods. Makes sense. Um and then we look up the method and then uh, we will return it to the uh, interpreter when we need it. Um, and then, you know, that's a pretty simple algorithm. Doesn't Java have a thing? So I did this in Kotlin and Kotlin does have like a get or else where you can return it. But I thought Java also has a, has like a get thing that returns nil or maybe returns an option. Or something. I don't know. I'm pretty sure Java has a thing for this. But whatever. 
All right, so now this is where we're going to actually implement a lot of that trickery from before because we're going to talk about what this is. Uh, yeah, so in a lot of languages, the keyword is self. And then a bunch of other languages like Java uses this. I like how it's done in Python because as they said, Python, it, it's not, well, maybe I don't like, I don't know. But anyways, Python, you just sort of pass it into every function or you pass it into every method. So it's just an argument. It's just a regular argument. So you can give it whatever name you want. It's kind of similar to how it works in go to with um, receivers. So you can just give it kind of whatever name you want. Yeah. Um, Rust also like pass self explicitly, and well, in C++ it's it's become like obvious that you sometimes need to do that when writing generic code. So yeah, they're adding this feature in C++ twenty three. So kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, because you often need that. Um, yeah, for like generic code, and if you want to like take like also if you want the this. "Quote unquote, this would be like a like something that's moved. Then you'll then you also need this feature. So yeah, it's like you can't make this uh, template parameter in C++. So like which cause people to write like full overload for the same thing. And yeah, exactly. Because then... you need it for like because if you want something special for like the like when you're taking like a ref ref. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he gives this example here of like, what's supposed to happen if you try to print this. So, uh, so we talk about here, so this is what we just said earlier, but we take this at the point that the method is access to it. Um, and then we realize that it's kind of similar how we did closure. So we can reuse a lot of the code or not. Well, actually we end up copy pasting a lot of code, but we can copy paste the code for closures. Uh, that we use. So, what do we talk about that? So, yeah, so this is just, you know, he's drawing out how this is working. So, when you first make the cake class, you have your, your method here. And then when you make an instance of it, and then you access it inside of the instance, then it, you know, then now this this closure, the environment for this closure is pointing to the instance instead of pointing to the class. Um, and this is actually, this gets into what we talked about before, and it's also going to be at the end of the chapter about prototypes. Because the idea is that, well, it's kind of arbitrary to have this difference between like the instance and the class here and then the, the things inside the instance. So in a prototype based world, you just sort of have a long amount of chains, like all pointing to each other. So the closure sort of closes everything around it, uh, which makes it simpler to implement because you don't need two different things. But, well, we'll get into that later. Um, so let's see. We're using our environment code. Uh, yeah, so now we get this to work. Uh, cause so this is just, so by using the same thing, it's other, so th with this strategy, we don't have to rewrite a lot of the logic for like, if you have a local function inside of a method, you know, it'll just all kind of do the right thing because the way that we're going to be parsing the method or the way that we'll be interpreting the methods is very similar to how we're doing functions. Um, so whatever we parse this, uh, you know, resolve local, this is the same way that we just do variables. Um, let's see, because this isn't declared any scope. Oh, right. So I think this is something that we're going to change later because what we're, oh, no, no, this is in visit class statement, right? Because what we're going to do later is that we're going to add something that will prevent you from using this outside of a class. So that people can't use it in a weird way. Um, yeah, so then we find it. So this bind thing is kind of doing what I said is done in JavaScript, where you kind of, you know, where you, so what this bind function does is that it will, you know, take this environment and then it will define this 
inside of the environment and it'll set it to be whatever you pass into it. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, okay, so this is what I was just talking about. So this works. So at this point, it's like working and you can use this in a lot of the same ways that you know you'd expect it to work, but it is weird where you can just say print this at like the top level or something that's not a method. So what we're gonna do is that, honestly, the way that we're doing it is kind of hacky, but um, what we do, and so part of it is because we're gonna be doing inheritance later, which is, I think is why our solution to this is like extra verbose. But inside of our resolver, we just check to see if we're in a class. And if we're not in a class, we just give them an error. So that's handy. And then the last part, uh, I think it's the last part of this chapter. Uh, yeah, so is init, which is how we're going to be making our constructor. So he breaks down that uh, constructors are, you know, happen in two parts where you first allocate the memory uh, and then you and then you run the method. So he says, you know, most languages, like definitely like in Java, you just think of Java as being a, as just being another kind of method that's, you know, a special method. Um, I, I really like the side note. Let's see, a few examples. Uh, in Java, even though final, even though final fields must be initialized, it is still possible to read one before it has been, right? Yeah. And then exceptions, a huge complex feature added C++ mainly as a way to omit errors from constructors. Yeah, because like the only way that you can return an error from a constructor in C++ is through exceptions. Um, so by the way, so that's why a lot of people don't use constructors in C++ and they will just stick with like static methods. Well, yeah, I do, but a lot of people really, I feel like it's only a few people are doing this. Um, well, so what I normally do when I, I mean, I will have like a regular initializer, but the way that I access it in most of my programs is through, um, like, I mean, it's also true in JavaScript too, because like, in JavaScript, it's the same issue where, I actually, no, no, this is true in most languages. I mean, Java, everything where, you know, you can't, the, the thing that's returned when you call the constructor, right, with like the new keyword is that it's always going to be an instance of the object. But how do you convey if someone like calls the constructor with the wrong arguments or something like that? Like something that you can't ch be checked at compile time. Yeah, so, yeah. There's a really good article on this particular issue. Oh, what is it? I put it in the in the chat, hmm. and yeah, I think I think later languages. I think when yeah when we design these kind of things, definitely we need to think about that. Probably, yeah, probably constructors should be like behave like normal functions. They sh they should be able to return different types rather than just say it's will all yeah just like what yeah, so like you could probably change yeah. yeah so new is just it, it just yeah it's just a regular function yes yeah, so it's a regular function so you could make it turn a result or something like that yeah. so that's yeah, what i feel like we can still make it some syntactic sugar to make it like use nicer as if it's some kind of special thing but yeah but why then do it needs to be a regular function like in this case why is saying uh I don't know, Russ, but from something like this, like why would you want to be able to say new derived instead of like just derived dot new? You know, I feel like it's not that much extra work to say dot new instead of new on the other side. So I can I can live with I can live with this. Yeah, yeah, that's Russ what Russ gave us. Yeah. Basically. So yeah, this this uh this is interesting. I don't know what placement new is. Well, where the uh, bounds of the... Oh, placement is it... new is like doing the construction without allocating. So it's like you have a chunk of raw memory and you just put some object into that. 
Right. Yeah. Because oftentimes you need to be able to pass your own. Well, either an allocator, but oftentimes the way that your allocators work is that they're not actually like calling Malik or anything. You already have some arena that you set up or something. So you can just use that. Um, let's see. So yeah, so we just add some special code for init. Um, let's see. So it's just, you know, when you try to call the, if you try to call a class, it will call the init method if it exists. Um, what is this? Um, if initializer equals null. I forget what this arity thing is for. What is this arity thing for? If there's an initializer, how many arguments you must pass? Um, no, it doesn't really say what it is. I forgot what that's about. Um, there's this just for like every functions they have arguments. Oh, is the number of arguments. Right. Okay. So yeah, this is just yeah, this, this is just a function call. So um, let's see. Oh yeah, so there's this weird edge case about like, can you explicitly call init? Right. So like, will that like reinitialize the object or something? Uh, that's just kind of weird. We don't want people to be able to do that. So we just ban it. Uh, another way that we could have done it, and I think this, there's another endnote here, but another way to do it is that we could have like added like private and public things. So we could have made init private. Um, let's see. So yeah, so we just banned this. So we just add in a special case. Um, it's well, it's not banning this. It means just init will always return this. Yeah. Oh, oh, right. Yeah, I was thinking about something else. I think, um, right, because that's what we're talking about about returning from init. Yeah, because we want to just ignore the return value from init because we want init to return an instance uh oh that's what this is for yes so we want init to just return uh the value of the um, of the class right uh so that's what we're doing here uh, i also like this side note um which is talking about so he, in the over here he says that you know, he doesn't want to change. He doesn't want to change the rules for locks just to make implementing it easier. But he actually then says in the side note that there, it's just a trade off, right? You have to trade off how easy something will be to implement versus how much you're losing in terms of features. So you just have to, so the trick is to just figure out which corners to cut. So I like that. Um, then we have JavaScript. <laughs> it's it yeah. just blows up in popularity and then all the shortcoming just come back and bite. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, because JavaScript kind of was designed with a lot of corners cut in order to get whatever, you know, whatever browser it was, Netscape out the door. But um we create the closure that binds this so method. Yeah. So this is so okay. So this is what I was talking about. Um this is what I was talking about earlier. So to remove the ambiguity of trying to return from something else, since we already hard coded the fact that uh, that init will just always return this, we're just gonna ban. Um, we're just gonna ban that behavior. So you can't try to return from init. Oh uh, yeah, and that was it. This is a monster chapter. I I think it might be the longest one. I don't know. Uh, so they, then there's some cool challenges. So one of them is to make a static, uh, to make static methods. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. The other one is, you know, syntactic sugar. And then the last thing, oh yeah, so talk about adding private and public. So 
that's another so that's a tricky strategy too uh, fun fact a uh, javascript no longer no longer always allows you to freely access an object fields from outside its own methods uh, one of the newer versions of javascript i forget when but most browsers supported now is that you can actually have a you can use private inside of classes so it will be actually private except instead of using a private keyword like typescript does it uses the hash symbol which is kind of weird but like so in newer version of javascript you could say like which is probably in this version of edge you can actually have like you know this you know and then you could say you know uh, whatever so in here you can say this dot name equals max uh but if i try to say uh so if you try to access the internal property it'll oh Uh, it won't let you, oh, I guess it lets you do it in the REPL normally. Oh, well, it's undefined, but if I set it, does it let you access it in the REPL? Okay, well, you know what? Well, I guess this is a bad demo. Normally, what should happen uh, is that you just, I think you actually get a specific error. It doesn't, it's not just undefined. It says, like, you, you're not allowed to access uh, fields that begin with hash in it, but you can access it inside the class interesting uh, this this is for very new feature um mdn class uh private property accessor thing i don't know when this came out so so this is the description of you know how this works yeah, I'm all, also on this page, but it, it, I haven't seen like where it comes out. Yeah, so this has been in Chrome since 74. Chrome 74, I feel like it's pretty old, 2019. So it's not very new. No, yeah, but it's and kind so, of new feature. Safari was the last one to get it. So Safari got it in 2021. I mean, it got it two years ago. So um, I don't know. Anyways. Uh, yeah, so I really like uh, this design note about prototypes. Uh, so essentially, way back up here, we have this like distinction between classes and instances, or is that? Uh, I lost it. Oh, no, I think it was when we were talking about methods. Yeah, so we have this like, distinction between classes and instances, but what you can do in languages with prototypes is that instead of, you, you know, it can be a bit simpler where, where is it? Um, where did we talk about this? Uh, yeah, so you have an object where the behavior lives and then you have another object for the state. Um, yeah, so he talks about just getting rid of the di the distinction between class and instances um, by essentially you just have instances all the way down, right? But then instances have this feature where they can delegate to another instance to you know reuse its fields, which is pretty much inheritance. So you can see how using prototype, which by the way, so this idea of like having objects delegate to other objects. That's pretty much what prototypes are. And you can see how you can get like inheritance and other features of classes from using uh, prototypes. And also you can create classes using prototypes. So like that's how it works in JavaScript. Um, yeah. And then he talks about this thing where it's like how to measure the power of a language. You know, so, you know, breadth times ease divided by complexity. So breadth, you know, is just, however many things you could possibly do with the language. So, you know, C has tons of breadth because 
you could use it like you could make a website and see if you wanted to uh, or you can make firmware whatever you want right but then ease is how is how much effort it takes to do the thing so you could say c is not very easy if you're trying to make websites because you know you have to do a lot of work while python would be very easy to make websites with and then complexity is like just how how many features does the language have so you you sort of want to figure out how to optimize these things uh yeah and that's all i got <laughs> I just feel like in the particular case of the prototypes here, it's it's a case where he says about yeah, it is it certainly reduced the complexity of the language a lot, but then it's probably significantly hard to use. Yeah, like I think so. After yes six add classes, like almost no one writes prototype chain by hand anymore. It's just like, I feel like it's a loss, but still then people, st it, it's not become even more complexity because to understand how class work in JavaScript, you need to understand it's a syntactic sugar and under the hood, it's a prototype. Well, no, but when he's talking about complexity, he's not talking about complexity at the implementation, he's talking about complexity from the user. So a user. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's just now in JavaScript, you need to know both uh, no, prototypes know. Well, and the classes. Know. You don't have to know how objects work or anything like that in JavaScript, unless you want to make it fast. But, you know, you're writing JavaScript, so you already don't want to make it fast. So, like, you don't, as a user of JavaScript, I don't have to know anything about prototype chains if I'm just using classes. So it makes it, it reduces the complexity. Well, I guess if you want to know everything in the language, then you have to learn both of them. But like adding classes to JavaScript reduce the complexity for most JavaScript developers because they don't have to think about, you know, prototypes. Well, it's, I guess in his terminology, it makes the language easier to use. So ease gets, it's become like it's increased the ease, but uh, then the language complexity certainly increased because we. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So so I just just like uh, so that's his point here. Like language people always like to talk about minimal languages like Scheme. Oh, so good! It's the language is so small. Blah blah blah. But actually, it's not that simple. Yeah. That's a good point. I didn't think about it like that, but yeah, I agree. So like, I guess in JavaScript, adding classes reduced or made it increase the ease by more than it increased the complexity. So it ended up being a win for users. Yeah, and yeah, you can still, you can still like stumble upon the, some grumpy people on the internet saying like classes is such a bad idea for JavaScript, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can always find people with different opinions on those matters. Yeah, for sure. I think we can stop recording now. Yeah.